If you want to learn to observe, you're going to have to learn to read. There is a direct correlation between your ability to read and your ability to see. And we've been looking at some things that will help you to learn how to read. We gave you some general principles. You're going to have to learn to read better and faster. You're going to have to learn to read as for the first time. And you're going to have to learn to read as a love letter. And now we're in the process of setting forth some specific rules for reading. First of all, read the Bible thoughtfully. Thoughtfully to read is to study. Secondly, read the Bible repeatedly. Go back to the beginning often. Read it over and over again and in different translations. And then read the Bible patiently. Don't throw in the towel. Don't make a mad dash for secondary sources before you have exhausted the passage. And fourth, read the Bible selectively. I suggested six questions that will help you read it selectively and get a grasp, a personal grasp, on the truth you are studying. First of all, who? Who are the people? What is said about them? And what do those people have to say? Secondly, what? What's taking place? What's the idea behind the message? Third, where? Always locate yourself. Find out where is this taking place? Fourth, when? What time is it? Early in the morning? What morning? The fifth question is the question, why? Why is this included? Why does God choose to put this in a permanent record of his revelation? And finally, wherefore, which we paraphrased, so what? What difference would it make in my life if I were to apply this trip? Now today we want to look at a fifth rule. Read the Bible prayerfully. Learn to pray before during and after your Bible study. Anybody got a problem with prayer? Anybody want to learn how to pray? I've got a couple suggestions. First of all, don't listen to other Christians. That will only help you to pick up all of the cliches, learn all of the shibboleths to get over Jordan. I've discovered there are two groups of people who can teach you the most about praying. Number one, Listen to children. They are so refreshing, so realistic in their requests. And secondly, listen to new converts. They haven't learned all of the lingo. We had a man in our church who came to Christ. He decided to show up for prayer meeting and Bible study on a Wednesday night. We had the Bible study, and then we broke up for prayer. And the men went over in this group, and the women went over here, and the young people went over here. And we're going down the hall, and he said to me, uh, Hey, Howie, where are we going? I said, We're going down here to pray. He said, Good night. I got a problem. He said, What's your problem? He said, I can't say it the way you guys say it. I said, Friend, that's no problem. Thank God for that. <laughs> so he came in a prayer meeting. I knew he wanted to participate, but he was a little hesitant. Finally, I reached over and squeezed his thigh. Friends, I'd give anything if I had this on videotape. He said, Lord, this is Jim. I'm the one that met you last Thursday, remember? I really thought he'd give God a zip code. And he said, I'm sorry, I can't say it the way the rest of these guys say it, but I really love you, honestly, I do. And hopefully after I know you a while, I'll be able to say it a lot better. Thanks a lot. I'll see you later. <laughs> you know what he did? He turned on a prayer meeting. See, the rest of us were saying prayers. You know, we were reviewing our theology, taking our tour of the mission field, scraping the Milky Way. This guy is just talking to God. See, how could God be impressed with your lingo? The only thing that ever moves him is your heart. So the best way to teach people to pray is to encourage them to take the Scripture and turn it into prayer. God loves to be reminded of what he has promised. So tell him. Remind him. Claim his promises. 
And when you are studying the Bible, if you come to a place where you're hung up and you say, Lord, I, I can't make any sense out of this. I don't understand it. Then this is a wonderful time right in the middle of your study to carry on a conversation with God. There is a sixth way, and that is read the Bible imaginatively. You see, the average person thinks that this book is dreadfully boring. And furthermore, if you're going to teach it to them, all you can do is complicate the process. I find as I talk to people and say, why don't you read the Bible? They say, the Bible, good night. You know, that's so uninteresting. They sort of feel if they ever got a Bible, they'd have to blow the dust off of it before they ever opened the thing. Many times I am convinced the reason it appears to be dull to people is that we come to it dully. And one of the things that I love to see people do when they study the Bible is to pray the simple prayer, Lord, clothe the facts with fascination. Help me to crawl into the skin of these people, to see through their eyeballs, to feel with their fingers and their heart, to think with their thinking and to see with their seeing. Then the Word of God becomes a lie. Seventh, read the Bible reflectively or meditatively. Now, this is a hardy for most of us living in the laser lane. You know, in the old days, if they missed the stagecoach, they said, that's okay, we'll get it next month. Today, if a guy misses a section of a revolving door, it throws him into a tissy. It was in downtown Dallas not too long ago. The interesting thing is, we were before a battery of 20 elevators. A guy missed an elevator, they're going up every six seconds, and you wouldn't believe this guy was blown away, absolutely out of his gourd that he had to wait so long for the next elevator. We used to sing a hymn, I don't hear it very much anymore, and understandably, take time to be holy. That's exactly what it takes. You cannot be holy in a hurry. And since we're living in an instant society, you want television, just go over, you press the button, you got instant color and sound. You want to make some coffee, you just take a few crystals, put them in your little mug, pour some hot water in it, you got instant coffee. But there's no such thing as that in the spiritual realm. And I believe that's why the Scripture speaks so frequently about meditation. Joshua 1.8, This book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth, but thou shalt meditate therein day and night. Psalm 1, Blessed is the man that standeth in the way of sinners, that sitteth in the seat of the scornful for His delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law doth he meditate day and night. And I think, for those of you who are living in this generation, this society, facing all of the pressures that it provides, you need to program your mind with the Word of God. Take some time maybe at the beginning of the day, maybe at a coffee break or during your lunch hour or riding home from work or before you go to sleep at night and take the truth which you have been studying and reflect upon it. I am compelled to tell you that the greatest changes that God has brought in my life, He has brought through the process of meditation. Just allowing the Word of God to filter and percolate through my mind and into my life. You see, Bible study calls not for snapshots, but for time exposure. Eighth, read the Bible purposefully. That is, with the aim of the author in view. You remember we looked at that passage in 2 Timothy chapter 3. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable. And we discovered it's profitable for four things. It's profitable for teaching. It's profitable for reproof. It's profitable for correction. And it's profitable for instruction in righteous living. Therefore, every time you read any passage, ask, what's the purpose of this passage? What's this passage got to teach me? Is this passage rebuking me? 
Will this passage correct my life? And how will it instruct me in the path of righteousness? Every time you come to the Word of God, seek the purpose of the writer. And sometimes he will state it. For example, in John, he hangs the key at the back of the book. Many other signs did Jesus in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book, but these signs are written in order that you might believe and that believing you might have life through his name. But when you come to the book of the Acts, the key is hanging at the front door. This is where he says, but you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be my witnesses. In three different places, in Jerusalem, in Judea, and Samaria, and unto the uttermost part of the earth. Ninth, read the Bible acquisitively. That is not only to receive it, but to retain it. Not only to perceive it, but to possess it. I got up early one morning, went into the bathroom, filled the basin with water, and proceeded to shave. Only when I went to put my razor into the water, I discovered there was no water there. And I thought, well, you know, it is a little early, so I filled it up again and proceeded to shave, and the next time I went to plunge my razor in the water, the water is gone. So I proceed, we've got to do a little observing. And I discovered that one of my creative sons had taken his mother's ice pick, took the stopper, and put five of the nicest holes you have ever seen, actually in the form of a star. And through those holes leaked all of the water in the basin. And I've often thought, that's what somebody has done to you and to me in the process of getting an education. They punctured holes in your mind with the result that your mind becomes like a sieve. Every time you nail down a board, you learn that you nail the thing in and then turn the board over and whack it down so that it won't come out. That's what you want to do every time you study the Scriptures. And then tenth and last, read the Bible telescopically. That is, in light of the whole. You see, in Bible study, the whole is greater than the sum of the parts. Now, that's bad math, but it's good method. Here we've got nine people in our class. Let's suppose we took each of these nine persons and dismembered them. Put them out here on nine tables. We now have all of the component parts of nine people. But with that entire collection, we don't have as much as we have in one of you living, breathing, functioning as a human being. Because the whole is greater than the sum of the parts. Now, the Bible is not simply a collection of parts. It is an integrated message. And what happens in a lot of Bible study and a lot of Bible teaching is that we keep breaking it down and breaking it down until we have these baskets of fragments, but there's nobody putting it together. So the one thing you want to learn to do is every time you analyze the Scripture, every time you take it apart, you realize you've only done part of the task. Your next task is to put it back together again. Well, here are the ten rules for reading. And you say, well, how do I apply them? Well, I would not suggest that you are going to sit down and say, I shall now proceed to read the Bible purposefully. And now I am reading it repeatedly. But what you want to do is to get such a personal grasp on these basic rules that you do it habitually. In other words, every time you are reading, you are reading with a different perspective. And we want to try this on for size. I'm going to read a passage to you out of the Gospel by Mark, chapter 5, beginning in the last part of verse 24. And what I want you to do is to assume the perspective. We want these three ladies over here to assume the perspective of the woman. 
want Vince and Carol and Stefan to assume the role of the disciple. And our three friends over here are going to assume the role of the Savior. Now put yourself in the shoes of this individual and ask yourself, what would it be like if I were the woman, if I were Jesus, if I were the disciple? So listen as I read. I'm reading out of the New International Version. You follow in your text. A large crowd followed and pressed around Jesus. And a woman was there who had been subject to bleeding for 12 years. She'd suffered a great deal under the care of many doctors and had spent all that she had. Yet instead of getting better, she grew worse. And when she heard about Jesus, she came up behind him in the crowd and touched his cloak because she thought, if I just touch his clothes, I will be healed. And immediately her bleeding stopped. And she felt in her body that she was freed from her suffering. At once, Jesus realized that power had gone out from him. And he turned around in the crowd and asked, Who touched my clothes? You see the people gathering against you? His disciples answered, and yet you can ask, Who touched me? But Jesus kept looking around to see who had done it. Then the woman knowing what had happened to her, came and fell at his feet, and trembling with fear, told him the whole truth. He said to her, Daughter, your faith has healed you. Go in peace and be freed from your suffering. Now let's look at this passage from the perspective of the woman. What was it that grabbed you? I would be extremely discouraged if I had been ill for 12 years, had spent all my money, went through all these different doctors, and was still sick and worse. And worse, mm -hmm. having spent everything that you did. Mm -hmm. Good. You feel what this woman had, why she was so urgent? I think I would feel that um, I'd, I had got, gotten to the end of my rope. I was desperate. All right, so that underscores for us, Dancy, this was a hopeless case. Not because of lack of human effort. She tried, mm -hmm. but was not improving. Anything else you see in this? Well, she had to be frustrated for 12 years. That's a long time. That is a long time. To be time. sick. And, uh... Now, someone could say, well, you know, it was before the days of obstetrics and gynecology. If she had a good OBGYN, man, it would have solved her problem. But you see, that doesn't help her. And here we've got a frustrated individual who tried every effort, but didn't get better. Rather, she grew worse. All right, what about the disciples? Put yourself in their shoes. What, what grabbed you about them? Disciples hit me um, as secret service agents. They're out there to protect their savior mm -hmm. from the crowd. We've got to get him through. That's our main goal. We don't care about certain individuals, but we've got to get him through this crowd and protect him. Isn't it interesting to see that here's Jesus Christ being distinguished between the indiscriminate press of a mob and a touch of faith? I felt that um, uh, my first reaction was that the disciples were either overwhelmed or like, how could you ask such a silly question? How, how could you even imagine who touched your robe when there's so many hundreds of people around? They were just overwhelmed or uh, couldn't believe he would ask such a question. Vince, that's the thing that grabs me more than anything. Here they are going down a road, people trying to press in to get a glimpse, to catch a word, and all of a sudden he whips around and says, who touched me? And how in the world do we know who touched you? Man, they've been touching you since the last city. <laughs> but you see, Jesus Christ distinguishes. Mm -hmm. They thought they were protecting him. They, they probably were a little embarrassed that they didn't have an answer for him mm. <laughs> and uh, was probably somewhat uh, intimidated by the question. Good, mm -hmm. good. Now, what about the standpoint of the Savior? If you were the Savior in this, what would you have felt? He felt power going out of his body because he was God, and that's unique to him. Uh, we would never feel that type of power. That's right, unique to him. So we know we've got a unique person, but he perceives the power has gone forth. It's not arbitrary. I think also you, there's the, the individual uh, sensitivity to one individual versus within the midst of a crowd. Mm -hmm. So it's personalized. 
Isn't that a comforting mm -hmm. word, Bill? Yes. I mean, we're not lost in the crowd with Jesus Christ. I think of the joy he must have experienced when he turned, recognized that she was the one, and to know the hope that he had offered not only physically, but spiritually for her as well. And assure her that it was her faith. Right. Now, notice what we've picked up in a relatively short time in just a little passage of Scripture by reading and observing it from a particular perspective. And that's what you want to do every time you study the Scriptures. Try to put yourself in the position of different individuals. Come at it from different perspectives. That's what you have in the Gospels. That's why you have Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. All four are looking at the life of Jesus Christ, but each one with a totally unique experience. That's why they tell us some things, do not tell us other things. Sherlock Holmes said it repeatedly to his associate, Watson, some of us see, but we do not observe. In Proverbs chapter 20 and verse 12, there is an incredibly insightful verse. The hearing ear, the audio component, and the seeing eye, the visual component. The Lord hath made even both of them. So our task is clear. Learn to listen. Learn to look.